in the leaves. This is the hangout that we do once in a while, and joining me today are Anne Gillespie Mitchell, Juliana Zook Smith, and Amy Johnson Crow. Our topic today is getting children involved in family history. Now, I don't have any children of my own, but I do have seven nieces and nephews. And so I'm just going to kick things off with a little story, and then ladies, feel free to jump in with your ideas. So a couple summers ago, some of my nephews were over, and they know what I do because I talk about it all the time. And so they asked if they could go to a cemetery. They'd never been to one. Might seem like an odd request unless you're a genealogist. I was thrilled to take them to a local cemetery. And the cemetery near my home, I have some great-great-grandparents buried there, so I gave them a name, and they went out looking for this name on the tombstones. It was kind of like a little scavenger hunt. And they loved it. They had a ball. And then the 8-year-old started looking to see other people who had the same name, and he was asking me how they were related to us, and I was explaining the relationships. And then the 7-year-old started doing the math. He was looking at birth dates and death dates and doing the math in between to see how old people were when they died. And uh, after about 20 minutes of this, which is kind of about their threshold, uh, the three-year-old had had enough, and he kind of looked at us and he just said, man, we're related to a lot of dead people, aren't we? <laughs> and I just thought, yes, yes we are. <laughs> um, but that one experience has led to them asking lots of questions, and even now, two years later, they still know if they have questions about their family history, they can come and ask me. So uh, a cemetery adventure was kind of a gateway for, for our family. Uh, what about the rest of you? What are some things you've done? I know you all have children or have other children in your lives or got interested as children. What are some other ideas you've got? Well, um, while I've never been able to get my son... <laughs> involved yet, but I still have hope. I did do something fun last summer with my 17-year-old niece, Rachel. We decided we wanted to hang out together, so I invited her to come on a genealogy tour with me. We went to Virginia, and we just drove around to different locations. Um, we uh, went to cemeteries, like you said, which was great fun. She had a good time just tromping around and trying to find them and all that kind of stuff. And I even took her to courthouses, right? So her first experience was not online. It was in the court. And in Virginia, it's great because you can just walk in and pull books off shelves. And, you know, she got really into it. She would find ancestors that she just really liked. We found this one guy. He wasn't our direct line, but... Uh, we found out, we had thought his first wife had died, but then we found the divorce records. And then we found the divorce records from the second marriage. Uh -oh. We had a good time with that. But she felt, you know, she figured this out. So it was really good on her. So that was a lot of fun. So, you know, I sort of the same thing you did, Krista, but there's nothing like being there, right? That makes all the difference. Well, and you said you let her figure some things out for herself, too, which those little successes get them excited about things. <laughs> They're no different I, than we are. <laughs> I agree. I, with my daughter, I kind of took the same approach that my mom took with me. When I, I, if you saw joined us for the first Behind the Leaves, I told the story of how we used to have a microphone reader in the basement, and she got us started by paying us a quarter to find names in the census. So with my daughter, I would t take her and show her some of the searches I did, and I had her create a tree and try and find, I gave her like an assignment when she was younger to try and find a certain person. And when she got involved and could actually find them, that made a big difference. But uh, probably my biggest success came, and this is, I have a little advantage because I do this professionally, as I had to go speaking one time, and she came along with me to this conference, and so she had to listen to my whole spiel, and I told how I found my fourth great-grandmother, Mary Tobin, in the poorhouse, and she was really interested in that story. And so I went, we went back, and I had to work in the booth, and I was helping a lady, and another lady came up and was standing waiting, and my daughter grabbed her by the arm and said, Come here, I'd like to show you how we found Mary Tobin in the poor house. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my great triumph. <laughs> That's awesome, though, right? Ownership in it your was. family story, right? <laughs> right. But getting them involved in the search and then also incorporating the stories, because I think it was the story that made it interesting for her. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. My my daughter, she's still, you know, kind of like like Anne's son. You know, my my daughter hasn't really caught the bug yet, but she has shown more interest now. I used to take her to the cemetery with me all the time. I mean, and, and fortunately, she she liked hanging out and and going to the cemetery. Her job, and and she took this on herself. 
her job was always to clean off the tombstones. So, you know, if, if there was grass all over the tombstone, that really, really bothered her. Um, if only she would have taken so much care of her room, but that, that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> but, but she would always go and, and, and clean off the tombstones, and, you know, sometimes she would actually help me look for particular names, and she would get interested in different symbols that, that she would see. But uh, a few months ago, I had taken the Ancestry DNA test, and when I got my results back and I was showing her the ethnicity estimate, it was she was like, oh my goodness, can I do that too? Sure. Um, you know, so she was just really, really geeked about, you know, seeing how, you know, I you know, I'm forty five percent Irish and you know, I'm nineteen percent Scandinavian. I mean, don't I look nineteen percent Scandinavian? Very um, definitely. Um you know, she was really excited about that, and so for her birthday, I got her an Ancestry DNA test. So, yeah, <laughs> that's what she wanted. So that's what I got her. I love that. Um, so yeah, so like family vacations, um, trips to places they've they've known or that that are connected to your history, pulling them in with the stories, cemeteries, and now I love this angle of DNA as a way like to attract those who might be a little bit more science minded or you know like I love that geeked out right by the numbers and the percentages. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my nieces are the whole map thing. Yeah, I've got finding a lot of my nieces. I still haven't got my daughter to spit. I've got the test, but she won't spit for me. <laughs> so I gotta get out of it. But um, but my nieces have all got trees online now that are connected with mine. So I think that's really cool this, that that using cool. this the DNA to get them interested. Yeah, love that. Another, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say another thing that I've done with some of um my nephews is that if I can come up with the veterans in the tree um, and start talking about you know well they were in the Civil War they were in the Revolutionary War and they were at such and such battle and even my nieces right because they study all this stuff in school you find that um, it's that story and being able to tie it to something that they're actually studying that is what makes it sort of come alive and makes them a little bit more interested yeah. so it, and I think if you keep you keep going back to it, it's always if you can tell them a story about the person and make the person real, then you're much more likely to get them involved. So it's finding that story. They're not going to spend hours pulling census records. Only were that crazy. You have to be pretty OCD, I think. Well, and yet, it, and it kind of that brings up a really good point, which is, you know, there has to be somebody when we're gone to pass this on to, right? And exactly. so we're always looking, like we're always hoping that everybody will be interested, but we're always looking for that spark in one of them that's going to be the twelve-year-old that sits down at the microfilm reader, whether they're getting a quarter or not, and 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 <laughs> that's that because we need somebody to pass this on to. Right. So I guess that's my next question to you guys is is what are you doing to look for that person in your family? that you're going to pass all of this work you've spent your entire careers and you know livelihoods putting together about your own families. I think it goes back to again the stories putting them in a way that's easily that somebody actually wants to get this um, whether it's in a, you know a big full book or whether it's just a, a little biography or, or a series of little you know mini biographies of people that they are interested to read maybe you start a newsletter or something that people decide they want to start saving it so I think putting it in a way in a, a medium if you will that is something that people will be able to access and have and keep is I think an important aspect of that I, I agree totally. Um, it needs to be in a format and needs to be arranged so that even a person who wouldn't call themselves a genealogist would be interested. So whether it's you know just having a couple pages about each person but telling about them and not just having you know document after document after document and making them put it together, I think that's really key. And I, I think that that also kind of brings up the issue of what do we do with the actual research that we've done? Because, you know, it could be that there isn't anyone in the family who's interested in inheriting all of the photo. Well, maybe they might be interested in photographs. But, you know, all the photocopies of the wills and the deeds and, you know, everything that we've collected over the years, 
So if we haven't found a family member who's willing to take on the four drawer, you know, filing cabinet, <laughs> thinking ahead about is there a genealogy society? Is there a library? Is there an archive who would be willing to take it and talking with them long before we are ready to actually give it up? Well, and even, um, can I use this as an opportunity to talk about public trees? <laughs> why don't we talk about public no, trees? <laughs> so I have gone paperless now with my family history research. Um, I no longer have the drawers and drawers and filing cabinets and binders full of things. And that was scary. <laughs> But I did it. I've managed to digitize everything, and now I'm in the process of attaching all of those wills and deeds and probate records and file, you know, pension files and all of those to my public tree. And not only did it save me a lot of space, which I needed, it also means that it's all now out there. Right. And I don't have to worry about, you know, my local historical society not being interested or a family member not being interested because I've attached it to my public tree. It's out there. If something happens to me tomorrow, it's still out there. It's still available for anybody who comes along and connects with anybody in my family tree. And and sure, I'm going to promote ancestry here, but that makes sense. But if you think about it, the public tree is the perfect place. Somebody asked me about this at the conference because, you know, God forbid something happens to you it's all out there and it will be all out there and you know you might want to take all your hard copies and donate it to a genealogy society and archives or everything else which I think is a really great thing to do and for like my family Bible I'll probably donate it to the Virginia library if none of my people want it but if you put it out there later I mean don't you guys just love it when you find that stuff online you happy dance around the room so Krista you have created this whole array of happy dancers Yep. By putting, so, you know, Krista, the ins inspiration for Happy Dance. I'll give you that one. <laughs> well, and that's, I think, something a lot of people don't realize about, um, you know, I, my tree used to be private. I, I freely admit that. Um, I actually, the impetus for making my tree public was DNA. Um, I didn't want to have to respond to every single message I was getting from every single cousin to view my tree. And so I just made it public so they could access it. Um, and of course it still has errors in it and it's still not complete and I still haven't uploaded all the documentation and all the source citations that I've collected over years and I mean like it's not it's never going to be done but you know the reality is if it had been private and something had happened to me it would have remained private right and I don't know that anybody in my immediate family would have made the effort to go jump through the hoops that were required to access my account and you know and so then all of that work that I've spent decades of my life doing would have been locked up forever right so, so and that, that's really sad <laughs> yeah. yeah that is really sad so and and I think too one of the things while I'm all for putting it in the archives and the genealogy societies like I'm sure with county historical society which is really large would like to have all of my stuff and I'm more than happy to give it to them but like you said Krista and this is a really good thing to think about is that when you put it on an online tree and make it available online that is also something that I think people really need to consider doing yeah. Because you, it may not be one of your nieces and nephews or children who get into it, but we all know we have lots of distant cousins, and if they pick that up, you've passed it down to somebody. You've made that connection, which is what it's all about. So yeah, I, I think you need. I think when we plan, and I never really thought about this before, so I'm glad we have this conversation. You need to have the online place to have it, and then have a you know, the brick and mortar place as well. Yeah. Well, and as we yeah, talk about an offline place, Amy, I actually have a question for you because you're a librarian, right? Which, which is, you know, what is it that these libraries and historical societies might actually accept from us? Because, you know, they might take Anne's family Bible, but they might mm -hmm. not take my file full of Xerox copied birth certificates from 30 mm -hmm. dates around the country, right? Yeah, and, and that's, that's a great question, Krista, because it's going to vary from library to library, archive to archive, society to society. Um, some of them will accept darn near anything. Some of them, it has to be something very specific, you know, because space is a consideration. You know, you, you just think about your own office or your own area where you keep your genealogy papers. Um, paper has this... Uh, habit of somehow procreating. I don't know how it does it. Like socks. But, 
But I, I swear, I close my office door at night, and when I open it again in the morning, you know, there's just, there's twice as much paper as there was when I closed the door the night before, so. <laughs> and is it anything useful? Is it that new deed or will that you've been looking for? No, that never. No, and that's the thing. You know, I, I keep wishing that, you know, the little, you know, genealogy fairies would come and just drop this document on my desk, but the way my desk looks right now, I would never find it, so maybe it's best that they don't right now. But... Think about those things that you have, whether it is your, whether it's your research files or whether it's those family heirlooms like the original family Bible or that postcard collection. And instead of just writing it in your will that you want the family Bible to go to the, you know, uh, the with his with County Historical Society, contact them first before you write your will and talk to them and say, hey, I've got this family Bible, or I have this collection, or, you know, whatever, and say, you know, start talking with them and see if they're interested, and if they are, what do you need to do to prepare to make it easier for them? Because they don't want to, I, I can assure you, no archive wants to get 14 boxes full of papers that aren't organized at all. It's going to take them forever to go through it and make it accessible to other researchers. Which is why you really also need to digitize everything. Yeah. But, and, you know, with the Bible, I've also digitized the Bible because then I can help put it online and give it to a lot of different people. Because, let's face it, if it's at the Virginia Library, who is ever going to see it? <laughs> and that's the problem. There are so many I, things that I, have I, never I been digitized. No, but think about it. There are so many things that have never been digitized, and we know this, right? And if you don't digitize these things and share them, no one has access to them because they don't know to go look for them, or they just simply can't go look for them, right? Right, and, and I, I don't think it's an either-or. I don't think that no, it's no. a digitize or donate. I think it's a digitize and it's, donate. And, and, that, that's, and, and like you said, nobody wants your piles of papers. There are just a few things I think archives really want, but it's that whole digitization. Ooh, yeah. Is that that was an right? awesome word. <laughs> yeah, digitization <laughs> and New word of the day. archiving. Because, let, you know, if you really want to get a wide audience... And, and I think I've had a hard time wrapping my head, okay, I want my tree private because, oh, it's got errors, it's not 100% right, it's not documented here, it's not sourced there, whatever. But, you know, if you don't put it out there, nobody else can pick it up and run with it. And we yeah. all do better research when we research as a group. So right. um, you guys have mentioned scanning things. I don't know if this is where Julie's going or not, but, um, you know, not everybody has a scanner in their house. What do we do? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you have one of these, you have a scanner. True. Yeah. If, you, if you have a if you have a phone with a camera, you have a you have a scanner. Is it archival quality? Eh, you know, it, it's. I, I, I think that there are there are some purists who would who would say that this isn't doing it. But hey, if it's if it's a choice of using my using my phone and the shoebox app, and and getting a good you know getting a digital image of that record and not digitizing it at all, I'm using this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's better yeah. than nothing. It's really yeah. Easy. yeah, no, another thing I was going to mention too is one of the one of my goals for this year is I want to start writing up some of my family stories and submitting them for publication in periodicals some oh, of the, for some of the places where my ancestors live because I think that you're not only you know, getting it out there and making it published, but you're also putting it in front of an audience that's, you know, very interested in research in that area. So you're helping in a number of ways, and you're also helping to preserve that story because, as we all know, we've got, um, in fact, like the New England Historic Genealogical Record is online on Ancestry.com going back, I think, 100 years. So really, that's another great way to preserve it in a nice scholarly fashion, but you're also getting the story out there, too. Yeah, I think some people think, oh, well, why would I want to write the story of my ancestor? Nobody else is going to be interested. What, you know? yeah. But I think we've learned, yeah. There's a couple of reasons why publishing is such a great idea. One is, as genealogists, we have learned things. And it doesn't matter if you're brand new at this or been doing this for decades. You have learned some things, and right. there are things that people can learn from you. And so writing those articles teaches methodology. Reading those articles, I learn methodology all the time. The other reason is, I think sometimes we forget that our ancestors aren't just ours. 
right? Like, I have a third great-grandfather. I tell this story all the time, but we've managed to discover 8,600 descendants. This guy was only born 200 years ago. And, um, you know, so putting it out, 8,600? Yeah. He had 18 children, so he was off to a good start. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> but, oh, wow. but if you publish an article about somebody in your family tree, there are going to be other people who connect with that person. It's going to, to help them. Yeah. Well, and, and another benefit of publishing is just the act of writing. As soon as you start to put everything together to write it, that's when you find the holes in your research. Yep. It's, yeah, it's true. And that's that is you, way too true. <laughs> Juliana, maybe not. Um, and I also blog about things, right? Because that's another way, right? Because people will go Google things, and if you publish on there, it's another source for a different group of people who might find it. So yeah. it's just getting the information out there. And anybody can set up a blog. There's you know, yep, free blogging fun. platforms, and yeah, you just go out there and start writing. And, and yeah, writing helps you. Yeah, and Amy blogs. started a great program, too, the 52 Ancestors. Okay. Yeah, 52 ancestors in 52 weeks. 52 ancestors in 52 weeks. But if you don't share the information, whether it's with kids or adults, look, I'm wrapping it around to the beginning here. Um, nobody's going to do anything because if you don't find ways to talk about it to make it interesting, and it's the stories. Yeah. Nobody cares about looking at a census record unless it's one of us, and then we love it. But let's face it, they want to hear the stories, and it doesn't matter how old they are. They just that's what they care about. So that's it what draws them, yeah, draws them right back in. My eight-year-old nephew, um, you know, was one of the cemetery trumpers two summers ago. Just last month, he asked if he could have a sleepover at my house because he wanted to talk about our family tree. That was the whole purpose for the sleepover, and I thought. What, what? And it was just because I tell the stories. I tell the stories all the time. And so he knew if he wanted to know something, I was the person to come to. That was a good day for you. It was. Yeah, it was a good no day. <laughs> yeah. Well, ladies, this has been fabulous. I love when we get together and do this. It's so fun to hear it your is. stories. And you, you guys have so much knowledge and such a breadth of experience. I just love Love hearing the things that you have to share. So that's all we have prepared for the rest of you today. I hope you enjoyed our Between the Leaves Hangout. We will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye. Goodbye.